Of all the many characters in Baldur's Gate 3, none of them are likely as crucial, yet mysterious, as Withers. An undead being with the power to respec our class, summon allies from other planes, and most importantly, resurrect members of the party for the meager price of 200 gold per person. If we ever question who he is or why he's helping us, we're merely met with more riddles or just a straight up refusal to answer. Fortunately, Withers himself is not the only means by which to obtain these answers, and scattered across Across the game are numerous clues not just to who he is, that's actually one of the easier answers, but also why specifically he's helping us, as well as plenty more subtext to his character. So let's start from the beginning to uncover the complete lore and secrets of Withers in Baldur's Gate 3. What a curious way to awaken. The first location, holding a ton of clues about Withers, is actually the ancient crypt, right next to the starting beach area, which if you go into at the start of the game, is where Withers will first emerge from. Prior to that though even, rummaging around this place leaves plenty of extra clues to be uncovered. Starting up in the refectory, there's a hooded statue at this end area, adorned with ancient text to a forgotten god. The book on the altar then, titled Chapel Records, is described as having a tiny script littered with short obituaries, of which we can read three, with the key bits of information recorded being the person's name, the god they presumably worshipped, and the way they died. Clearly, the purpose of this crypt, once upon a time, was to maintain records relating to death, and heading into the next room, the associations only start to become stronger. This place wasn't built for the living. Indeed, between the banners of a skull clutching a scroll between its teeth, to, well, this comment on a skeletal scribe statue, if you pass a religion check. That's Jackal, scribe of the dead. I didn't think anyone still worshipped him. It's pretty clear whom this ancient crypt was once dedicated to, Jurgle, whose lore we'll look at in the next chapter, but first, there's a few more clues around the ancient crypt worth taking a look at, with the first being the Book of Dead Gods off in this side room. Clearly, mortal deaths are not the only ones the scribes of Jurgle were keeping records of, and successfully opening this book and passing a religion check reveals this. These are the names of gods once lost but now restored after the second sundering. The last three names in this book sit close together, but are so devastated by the scroll as to be unreadable. The Second Sundering is essentially a huge reset event in D&D lore, which brought back a ton of deities, as well as changed world geography and ushered in a whole new lease of life. The last three unreadable names are likely hinting at the Dead Three, who are of course revealed later to be the main villains of the game. And it's clear their return in this case is no doubt tied in with the introduction of Withers, whom will of course awaken from the richly adorned sarcophagus right behind the statue of Jurgel. But only after first awakening and defeating the entombed scribes. Presumably a security measure put in place to stop any old looters from ransacking Withers' tomb, but clearly our party is a lot more than that. And in fact, one could even say that our winding up here was fated. Here lies the guardian of tombs. Through knowledge comes atonement. So with a tiny bit of digging, this first meeting tells us everything we need to know about Wither's true identity. Guardian of Tombs? Now that's also the name given to Jurgle, scribe of the dead and lord of the end of everything. And as we continue through the game, more and more clues simply start to surface that Wither's is in fact Jurgle, or at least this mummified body is fully under the control of Jurgle. And we'll touch on this more as we go through the video, but why is the scribe of the dead choosing to take such a an active role in our adventure at all. And to answer that, we'll have to dig deeper into the lore surrounding the history of Jurgel. What is the worth of a single mortal's life? For much of D&D lore, death is a complicated thing, with no singular entity presiding over the entire thing, but rather different gods ruling over various aspects of death. The most obvious example of this in-game is again the Dead Three, with Bane serving as the god of tyranny and strife, Baal of course being the god of murder, the most violent of deaths, and Merkel presiding over the actual deaths. Before these three though, there was Jurgle, the original god of death who served in the role diligently 
and simply did the job he existed for to the letter, maintaining an orderly record of souls as they transitioned from life into death. Depicted most often writing onto a scroll, and described always as having a voice like the dry whisper of a forgotten tomb. Now, who does that sound like? However, after untold time presiding entirely over death by his lonesome, Jurgle grew somewhat bored with his position. So, when Bane, Baal, and Merkel requested dominion over death, Jurgle bequeathed to them their respective aspects of it, fading into obscurity as a god himself, hence the ancientness of this initial crypt and their text being written in a forgotten tongue. Though Jurgle didn't disappear entirely, rather sticking around and serving as seneschal to Merkel, simply keeping his records and archives of the dead. Eventually, the dead three were initially killed, after which Jurgle begrudgingly served the chaotic Cyric, and finally the far more balanced and benign god of death, Kalimvor. Now that brings us back to the events of Baldur's Gate 3, the dead three's return and Withers or Jurgle's emergence from this crypt. And with all this in mind, it first begs the question just who Withers is referring to with this line. So he has spoken, and so thou standest before me, right as always. And now, we could first assume that he is actually referring to Jurgle, and Withers is merely an aspect of him, referring to the greater being. And this would fit with Jurgle's role as a scribe recording the unfolding of fates, but this isn't necessarily the case. Whenever controlling another vessel, like hirelings, Withers refers to them as this vessel, rather than to himself in the third person, like he would be doing here. Then, there's also the fact that this particular sarcophagus was especially guarded, and the fact we can't deal him any damage, suggesting something especially divine about him. So rather, I think the he being referred to is something higher than even Jurgle, that apparently is always right. Possibly Kalimvor, whom he serves now, or maybe a higher god even, like Al. Though for lack of a definitive answer, let's just call he fate for now, especially given how common this line is. Thy wheel of fate turns ever to the dark. As well as this, should we attack him in the crypt and then ask why he can't be harmed, Withers will say this. Fate has not declared mine injury, therefore it shall not occur. It's a classic Withers style line, but at the same time, it does suggest the very laws of causality themselves forbid Withers from suffering harm. Like the world itself is simply going nope every time he gets hit. But onto Withers' question about the worth of a single mortal life, which I think is asked purely as a curiosity for him. Giving of course a small response to each of our answers, but otherwise saying that he's satisfied. Of course, the right answer in this context is I guess 200 gold, but sadly that doesn't come up as an option. With the question answered then, we're simply told we'll meet again at quote unquote the proper time and place, and sent on our way with him apparently needing to attend the crypt after so many years away. But before long, he will show up in our camp to play his main role, as our law friendly explanation for some of the most powerful mechanics we can take advantage of. But again, why? Thy name has been recorded. So first of all, the first time he shows up in camp after we meet him in the crypt, we're essentially greeted with a simple told you so. We meet again, as predicted. And from there, things progress pretty normally, without the ability to ask many questions. Although, of course, we will pursue every potential avenue in that regard. First though, what's curious is what happens if we bypass the entire crypt at the start of the game and simply wait until Withers randomly shows up in camp. Because yes, that's exactly what happens. With no cutscene or fanfare, he's simply available to talk to and greets us as he would any other party member, speaking to him for the first time. Ah, another. Again, keeping a record of souls is a classic Jurgle move, but beyond that though, I think the name being recorded in this case relates to how they're a member of the party, and thus able to be brought back from most forms of death. Indeed, Withers or Jurgle absolutely has a vested interest in keeping us and our party alive, the ultimate band of adventurers with the best hope of defeating the Absolute and its masters, which multiple times he does express a clear contempt for. And going back to the value of a mortal life question for a second actually, here's what happens when we say no other life matters aside from ours. At this particular junction, 
perhaps that is not so far from the truth. Back to determining as a character who or what he is though, Withers isn't even giving a single clue. There are many answers to that question. None are important. In fairness, going through the whole game thinking of him as nothing but a mummified, dry-sounding resurrection guy, and not Jurgle, Scribe of Death, does not make a difference to the quality or reliability of services he provides, so he has got us there. Though we can at least ascertain that Withers isn't simply helping us because he wants to. And this is what he says if we ask why he's helping us. Be assured. It is not by choice. At least it's kind of answered, but then begs another question. Who, or what then, is forcing Withers to come to our aid and follow our camp around to exercise his immense power? Also, whilst he says this in our first meeting, there are events in the game where he decidedly leaves camp to do things that very much seem to be of his own volition. But we'll get to those. Now, the most direct rejection to our questions does actually crack me up, and that's pointing out that skeletons shouldn't be able to talk. Correct. No. You know, for all the business-like scribe of the dead stuff, Withers does have a sense of humour. An exceptionally dry one, funnily enough, but there's definitely something there. And in terms of getting something out of the guy relating to who he is, you can, as a paladin at least, focus on and try to determine Withers' divine origin. He has a divine aspect, yes. A reflection of death itself, eternal and inescapable. But again, questioning further leads to his straight up refusal to answer. So really, there's not a lot to be learned from directly questioning the guy himself. Merely that he's here to help us, though not by his own choice. Enlisting his services, however, does teach us a little bit more about him as a character. Dost thou require a new ally? When it comes down to it, Withers is effectively capable of fulfilling the gameplay requirements that would otherwise be inexplicable, or at any rate a fair bit more complicated. These are on-demand resurrections and the return of an ally's body, if need be, summoning allies from the fugue plane that he himself controls, allowing for a more customizable party, or respecking your class to something else. There's other stuff, but these are the big three. So let's first look at resurrections. Not an entirely unique concept, and in fact something we could get away with without withers thanks to these scrolls of revivify. But given sometimes allies can die in inconvenient places, returning to camp and simply bringing them back there can be a lot simpler. And once again, the means by which withers does this is another pretty blatant clue that he's Jurgle. By doom and dusk I strike thy name from the archives. Rise must be a pretty straightforward job for the Keeper of the Archives of the Dead to simply take a name off, if he fancies. Though, in fairness, Withers doesn't always resurrect everyone every time, preventing death from being completely meaningless in-game, something he'll explain to the Dark Urge if they, for example, kill Alfira. The Bard's death is a weight for thine own conscience to bear. She will be left to the peace of eternity, where the urge shall seek her no more. I think if we discount that a game with zero proper death whatsoever would simply become devoid of consequence, there's also some interesting narrative implications here. Withers chooses not to resurrect Alfira, apparently on the basis that it'll make us feel the weight of our action more. And indeed, if the Dark Urge could simply undo all of their dark deeds, they'd have far less incentive to resist their dark impulses. So by leaving Alfira dead, it's clear that Withers' purpose isn't purely to resurrect people, but rather to facilitate the journey and development of our party, helping to nudge us along if things get tough, but never deviating from his basic goal, at least not for the moment. And we'll look more at Withers' special relationship to the Dark Urge a little later. On to hirelings though, and Withers does at least explain pretty conclusively who these guys are. With the Absolute causing chaos across Faerun, inflicting plenty of murder and death, Withers has personally sought out the finest warriors from the recently deceased, souls who even in death seek vengeance over the absolute. Though beyond their skills and willingness to aid us in battle, who they are was lost in death. These souls clawed their way back from the fugue plane for vengeance. The art of violence is one memory not lost to them, I assure you. 
Now, the fugue plane is where souls immediately go after death to be judged and collected by respective worshipped deities to eventually be taken off to their plane instead. It's also the place where Kelimvor resides alongside Jurgle, making them easy allies plugs directly from his plane. It also possibly explains why speaking through them requires so little effort from Withers. As for a lore reason why they're provided as potential additional allies, well, I think once again, this calls back to Withers primary goal here, to ensure our party the best chances of success in defeating the Absolute, and also maybe provide the souls of these warriors with some vengeance, which they so desperately crave after death. In terms of respecking, that at its core is a gameplay mechanic to inject more life into builds that may have become boring, but canonically I guess we could also say it's Wither's way of ensuring our best chance of success, with the skill set that complements the overall party the most. So on the whole, these abilities of Withers are at worst extremely high level spells and at best the workings of a god. Again, pretty much confirming that he is Jurgle, but also showing limitations as to what he will and won't do. And in his god role, Jurgle exists as an accountant of sorts for death. So stopping it entirely would put an end to his purpose, but clearly our party staying alive is more important for the time being than Jurgle's main purpose for existing, suggesting that only through our defeats of the Absolute, can Withers or Jurgle continue to run his day-to-day -day tasks as always. Which also explains, I think, the reasons behind his behaviour at the end of Act 2. Do Illithids possess souls? Following the defeat of Ketherick Thorm as well as Merkel's avatar, Withers on a rare occasion indeed elects to leave our camp and come to Moonrise Towers to ask yet another simple question. Do Illithids possess souls? As simple as this query is though, the answer isn't quite as clear as yes or no. Withers, of course, is 100% confident that Alithids do not possess souls, and being the guy in charge of recording where those souls go, I'd say he better than most would know. But still, there's a little more nuance, and listen to the wording here. The three amass an Alithid army void of apostolic souls that could imbue them with power. Now, the specific focus on apostolic souls here implies that the problem with the Illithid army, at least as far as the gods are concerned, is that Mind Flayer Ceramorphosis is essentially stealing away the souls of mortals that would otherwise pass through the Fugue Plane and ultimately serve to bolster the power of whichever god the mortals served in life. Remember those chapel records we found in the original crypt, recording a name, pledged deity, and cause of death? Well, clearly, the god somebody worshipped is one of the the most important things to keep a record of after they die. And the reason for that is largely the fate of their soul. But it seems anybody turned into a mind flayer doesn't have their soul pass on anywhere, and instead become lost, creating an imbalance in the delicate cycle of life, death, and souls. Withers even hints at this when we question why he's at Moonrise Towers. Where matters of balance are concerned, I am eternally called. And this further hints into the importance of Withers slash Jurgle's role in the grander scheme of things, serving as scribe and seneschal to ensure that the right souls end up in the right places, maintaining a very careful balance in the Forgotten Realms. Indeed, his very reason for aiding us in the first place may just be that his purpose to exist is threatened should all the souls of mortals be destroyed by Mind Flayers. So whilst he confirms not helping us out of choice, it may very well be out of necessity, to restore the all-important balance crucial to Jurgle. But whilst most Mind Flayers simply resemble fleshy, lifeless husks enthralled to their Elder Brain, is this to say the likes of the Emperor and Omelum are simply that too? Just because an essence of who they were, or a soul, doesn't empower one of the known gods in their death, doesn't mean we can disregard these highly intelligent entities as lifeless. We have to remember that Illithids hail from a completely different plane of existence, with their cycle of life and death appearing alien 
to mortals. Through their process of tadpoling and ceramorphosis, they may very well be stealing away the power of the mortal soul and using it to empower their elder brain or some higher entity completely removed from the domain over which Withers is concerned. Though this does make Withers question about the Dead Three's motives very interesting, because whilst they do control the power of the elder brain via the Crown of Carsus, they do stand to gain very little through the form of harvested souls, all of which they crave through one form or another. So Withers question is basically why are these idiots enacting a plan that doesn't actually make them any more powerful? And maybe the Dead Three are just being short-sighted and blatantly ignorant. Though if we jump ahead just a second, there is one clue that the Dead Three had something of a plan with this, explained by Bane himself through the body of Gortash. And by turning mortals illicit, you deny their souls to their keepers. You do not stoke fear by reaping your own fields, but by burning your foes. So the entire plan isn't so much to strengthen the Dead Three, but rather weaken all the other gods by denying them souls. And if the Dead Three's plan was to instead claim souls for themselves, I'm less certain Withers would feel a need to get involved, despite how clear his disdain is for the trio. His main concern is actually just with the weakening of his own purpose. And that, I believe, is why Withers comes to us in the first place. Though again, that first line he says, feels like he was instructed by a higher entity still in this regard. And it also explains the offerings and limitations of his services. Everything he does is about defeating the Dead Three and the Elder Brain all to restore balance, and he never ever deviates from that goal. Until of course he does, because from the end of Act 2, Withers actually starts to do things that we could even call compassionate. And again, the question is, why? There is no before. The first character, not definitively tied to our party, that Withers actually goes out of his way to help, is Arabella. That is, provided we save her from Korga in Act 1 and then send her to camp after rescuing her again in Act 2, agreeing to search for her parents. It's at this point Arabella starts to develop a bond with Withers, and much like us, she berates him with irritating questions that he only answers vaguely. So, what were you before you were this? There is no before. So you've always been a bone man? In a sense. I am neither dead nor undead, neither alive nor unliving. I don't get it. Thou wilt. Again, evidence he's an eternal being, i.e. Jurgle, but also notice here that Withers tells Arabella that she will understand things in time. This is picked up again later on after we discover Arabella's parents, who have died. And with her power of the decaying forest, as he calls it, Arabella enters this frenzied rage, at which point Withers steps in with quite possibly the highest display of emotion from him in the entire game. Listen! Dost thou not hear it? Where creation meets ruin, where morning meets midnight, the root of all being, balance. There's almost a sense of urgency there for a moment, like Withers needs to calm her and can only do so with a slightly raised voice. Arabella is, after all, pretty powerful, and who knows what she's capable of when her rage is untethered. And this balance that Withers describes once again ties back to Jurgle's responsibility to record lives passing into death and ensure that this universal balance is maintained. And then he does something really compassionate and particularly divine by showing Arabella her future, something that immediately sets her mind at ease and provides the courage to venture off on her lonesome. Except the thing about fate in this universe is it's not 100% set. It can't be. If it was, there'd be no accounting for the differing actions of player characters, the many twists and turns one can venture down in Baldur's Gate 3. Hell, there's no guarantee that this would have been Arabella's fate at all, as we can make sure she dies back in Act 1. 
Though Withers explains that from this point, Arabella is under the protection of the Weave, suggesting perhaps that Mistra is guiding her now. But had Arabella never met Withers, she never necessarily would have realized her destiny, suggesting that Withers himself is responsible for determining Arabella's future. And perhaps the reason he can show that future to her with such certainty is because he has had a hand in what it will be. It's an example of Jurgle being able to step out from his role as simply Scribe of the Dead, recording events as they unfold, and taking a more active stance to influence events and certain people to currently unknown ends. We've established that his presence in our party is likely to right the imbalance of souls caused by the Mind Flayer threats, a big problem for him, but there's no evidence to suggest a need to help out Arabella so much, to be so nice as she describes. But I do have one theory as to what Withers is up to here, and it relates to our next potential meeting with Arabella down in Baldur's Gate sewers, where she's easily dispatched a group of bandits and is studying a special stone she found, a stone imbued with records of all those who'd passed by it. Records which Arabella is described to be collecting as naturally as breathing. Now, keeping records of past events sounds an awful lot like Jurgle's job, right? Except more than just the dead, Arabella describes wanting to know everything. And this could even be in preparation for an ascendancy to godhood. After all, Arabella has seen the future Withers showed her, which apparently precipitated the need for her parents to die, and yet she's still pretty happy about it. And this wouldn't be the first time Jurgle has ceded his position to somebody else. And if that's what he's doing here, it seems as though he's showing more care to get it right. Giving up his power to the Dead Three, the first time ultimately led to the problem he's now having to deal with, and Arabella will hopefully be a more suitable candidate to inherit godlike power, even though there's something of a scary glint in her eye here. At the same time, perhaps it's not godhood Withers is considering her for, but possibly just a powerful hero of the future. I know Larian have said they aren't making Baldur's Gate 4 anymore, but perhaps someone will. And perhaps in that case, maybe a grown-up Arabella could feature as one of the companions. Regardless, the important thing for this video is to show that Withers isn't just a cold skeleton bound to his duty and nothing more. Though this example of Withers being especially nice isn't the only one, as Dark Urge players will know. I too still hold some power. After defeating Orin at the Baal Temple, the god of murder himself will appear and ask us to once again become his chosen. Though refusing him results in Baal reclaiming our Dark Urge blood, which is the gift that essentially created us and we can't survive without. Now, Withers may very well have resurrected us many times before this point, but this time is different. And in this instance, the only way for Withers to bring us back is to replace Baal's power with his own. And it's without a doubt the most badass Withers moments in the game. Thou art now faithless, godless, and doomed to wander the fugue plane for eternity. I will not permit that, though all the powers of life and death dictate that it should be so. I too still hold some power, and I invest a portion of it in thee who have challenged the gods, and now liveth to tell of it. Thy fight is not over, and it is thy fight. For one who can look upon Baal and oppose him can survive any crisis. So rise, challenger of gods, and prepare for battle once more. Death will not claim thee whilst I Okay, so are we saying that the Dark Urge now cannot die whilst Jurgle Scribe of the Dead still exists? Are we gonna persist alongside this eternal entity forevermore? Or is he simply saying that so long as he's around, nothing can specifically kill us without the chance of simple resurrection? He who can defy all the powers of life and death and simply dictate that we shall live, humbly declaring to still hold some power. Yeah, the Absolute is such a threat 
that to natural order that we do indeed get a literal god hanging around in our party. Because, now awed by this immense display of power, we could straight up ask who Withers is, to which we get the best answer that we're gonna get. A scribe, a seneschal, a keeper of records, and now thine advocate, both here and in the city of the dead. So Withers is not only fully describing himself as Jurgal here, but also promising to advocate for us, with the City of the Dead being Jurgal's main domain of residence. Not only that, but if we say death felt very peaceful just then, he'll explain that we would have wandered the Fugue Plain for eternity. Not really a peaceful afterlife, but that when the battle is over, he personally will find us a home. He also gives us an explanation here as to why he's so cagey with the truth all the time. I know all, but to state truths is to interfere, for the minds of mortals are easily swayed. My place, for the most part, is to observe. This intervention, the reclamation of thy soul, is beyond mine ordinary remit, but thou art extraordinary. And so are these times. Though we do have to wonder here just why Withers did do this. Is it because the party have no hope of defeating the Absolute without our character? That Withers' entire mission would be a failure if he didn't intervene here? Or is it an action more done out of respect for us? An admiration for our defiance of Baal, who literally gave us life and a reward for our bravery. The basic resurrection may have been done out of necessity, but the continued offer to ensure we're not left wondering as a godless soul by the end of it all is definitely Jurgle going above and beyond. Seeing us doing all this work to defeat the Dead Three, prevent the Mind Flayer incursion and restore balance has seemingly warranted admiration, maybe gratitude even, from Withers for fixing a problem he set in motion by initially ceding his power to the Dead Three a very long time ago. And as we know from that brief chat with Bane through Gortash's corpse, the plan is to screw over all the gods and deny them their power imbuing souls. And Withers isn't just carrying out his duty on his own behalf, but on behalf of all those whom he regularly ensures have their souls properly ferried through to the appropriate planes. It's still never confirmed why he was sent to us specifically, but maybe it really was just a collective decision by the gods to send him down here and clear up his own mess, so to speak. Another explanation for why he says he isn't helping us by choice when we first meet. But I think certainly through the time Withers spends in our camp, there is something of a character progression for him. From the cold, distant entity refusing to answer any of our questions, to the skeleton literally bestowing us with a portion of his divine protection. Withers has always done what he's needed to do to restore the balance of souls, though the means by which he goes about the task becomes almost warmer, or perhaps just more involved as time progresses. What is the worth of a single mortal's life? For all these very clear but subtextual clues linking Withers and Jurgle, though, there is one more that I want to mention in this video. And this location, in fact, is another one to check out if you're interested in the character in general. The Grand Mausoleum is found at the graveyard in the top right of Baldur's Gate Lower City, and heading inside this place is very reminiscent of the original ancient crypt, with much the same decor including banners of Jurgle's insignia and even another statue of Jurgle. Now, this is one of the four mausoleum sarcophaguses sarcophagi, in this location, with all the rest containing full-on skeletons with their own inventories which can be looted. This one though rather just contains a skull, as well as a scroll of revivify. Not necessarily meaning the occupant was resurrected, a skull is still part of a corpse, though the scroll is of course emblematic to Wither's job of resurrecting us. The most interesting clue down here though is the crumbling journal, with a passage that feels very familiar. Quote, I was still a supplicant when I came face to face with him, masked in gold, his skin fine and worn as parchment. Jurgle, the death keeper, the end of everything. I asked what he needed of me. He asked a simple question. What is the worth of a single mortal's life? 
I knew not how to respond, and said as such. He seemed nonplussed, neither disappointed nor pleased. I fell to my knees in respect for his awesome power. This garnered no reaction. There I stayed, trembling with an emotion I could not name. And when I stood again, the final scribe was gone. End quote. So there you have it, an account from an actual worshipper of Jurgle that actually recognizes him as such, and puts that name to a clear description of Withers. The skull in the sarcophagus back there is still something of an anomaly, but otherwise I'd assume these events took place right here, in a place so similar to the other crypts, and either this means Withers awoke here at another point in time before laying down again further along the Sword Coast, or it simply means that Jurgle is never actually there in his true form, but rather takes possession of various specially adorned mummified corpses to be his vessels in the mortal realm when the need arises. Of course, the mask with gold is also a characteristic of Withers, and maybe this is just the ritual that the scribes of Jurgle perform with the special corpses selected to become his avatars. It doesn't mean Withers isn't Jurgle, we might as well still see him as such, and the body he's in is utterly unharmable anyway. It's merely an indication that Withers perhaps perhaps is not the only body Jurgle has used. And perhaps in ancient times before Jurgle ceded his power, this was a more common practice and allowed him to commune with various sects of his worshippers more easily. Though why he appeared before this supplicant only to vanish after a few seconds is something of a mystery. But given what we know about his character now, it's clear he has very little care for being worshipped or adored. So maybe he just got fed up with all the feet kissing so to speak. Didst believe I would not notice. Back to the main events of the game, and actually past the final ending though, and provided we choose to destroy the Elder Brain, Wither's Party becomes a nice little epilogue, where again, we can glean some more details about Withers as a character. For instance, the presence of Melil at this party is due to an eternal debt he owes to Withers. After being cast from the Pantheon of Gods back when Cyric was in charge, Melil found himself cursed to wander the Fugue Plane for eternity, just like the Dark Urge would have after defying Baal. And just like us, Melil was saved from that fate by the direct intervention of Withers. Unlike us though, Melil hadn't repaid this debt by working tirelessly to save the world, and thus Withers has instead enlisted him for an eternity of honouring the worthy. Seems not all who curry favour from the god of deathkeeping are entirely thankful for it, and I don't know if this humanises Withers more or less. On the one hand, he's pulling a man from an eternity of purgatory, only to throw him into one of servitude, but on the other, he's making sure all his recruited heroes have some music to listen to whilst they celebrate in their victory. And that's another thing here. What with the encounter in the Grand Mausoleum and the musician kept on the proverbial payroll, it begins to make our little party's relationship to Withers feel a little less special. And we have to ask, just how many times has he done this? Recruited a party of mortal heroes to go around and write the balance of things. Aside from that though, we can see Withers still has plenty going on of his own, and operating out of this little ruin. Once again, keeping a record of the dead, and especially those that fell defending Baldur's Gate, in an effort to scout heroes for a potential return, presumably in the same way as the hireable allies. Additionally, there's a mysterious scroll Withers is writing, described merely as, quote, a missive in Withers' hand, addressed to some unknown entity. Though you understand the alphabet, the script and the words themselves, the meaning eludes you. You glean only the impression of dark sun in white sky and an offer or perhaps a warning?" End quote. Now, Dark Sun probably means one of two things. It's either a D&D campaign set in a post-apocalyptic desert, though I'm not sure how that would follow on from these events, or more likely the Dark Sun is referring to Cyric, the original successor to the Dead Three, taking over from Bane, Baal, and Merkel before Kelimvor finally did, and whom Jurgl also begrudgingly has performed as Seneschal for in the past. And about a month ago, I'd have strongly theorized this as a Tease for DLC or even a Baldur's Gate 4. But with Larian's recent announcements of dropping the IP, that doesn't appear the case. Still, if anybody does wind up making 4, Cyric would make sense as a follow-up villain to the Dead 3. And hopefully, with this little thread followed up, Withers himself could also return as the undisclosed god in the party. For now though, it's merely evidence that the scribe of death's work is never done. A fact that he passes on to us in Withers' 
closing victory speech. Until we meet again, I wish thee every possible fortune, health, wealth, love, and above all, problems worth solving. To you. <laughs> Well, looks like this cold, unfeeling scribe, who sounds like an old crypt, turned out not to be a completely emotionless pile of bones, after all. And in fact, tied with the Emperor, Wither's role in Baldur's Gate 3 may just be the most important that there is. A literal act of divine intervention, which by the end comes close to crossing as many lines as is possible. But despite the credits rolling after this speech, it isn't the last we see of Wither's, who, in a post credit scene, comes to finally gloat at his inadvertent victory over the three who originally succeeded him in dominion over the dead. Thou sought to bolster thy strength by taking away the souls of mortals, but souls vanish when their hosts become mind flayers. Didst think the other gods would not notice? Gods thou may be, yet thou hast proven thyself fools, everyone. So it turns out Withers never actually answers the question as to why the Dead Three are okay with not harvesting the souls of those they defeat, and thus puts it down to them just being total idiots. Of course, we learned that it was more the case of them weakening the other gods rather than strengthening themselves, but even still, the plan isn't exactly watertight. The Dead Three constantly plotted against one another and eventually would have fallen into conflict, no doubts, most likely causing the Netherstones to wane in power the same way we caused that to happen and letting this powerful elder brain break loose, wreaking havoc on the world, them, and ultimately the entire divine pantheon. Of course, if anyone was going to notice this growing imbalance of deaths and apostolic souls, it would be the keeper of such records. And let's just be grateful that Withers, or Jurgle, took such a proactive approach. For without his aid and, let's be honest, extremely powerful magic that costs next to nothing, magic which, by the way, can actually be looted back afterwards with little care from him, ultimately without Withers, our job would have been a lot harder. So call him what you will, scribe, seneschal, mummy, skeleton, Withers, juggle. When it comes down to it, the guy is ultimately a maintainer of balance for the sake of all the gods. But more than that, he's our safety net, a buffer to ensure we can't so easily fail the task at hand, a guide, sometimes a saviour, and eventually a friend, one whom I I hope continues to crop up in future media, whatever form that may take now. Because aside from the powerful yet distant role he plays, the guy's dry humour and uncharged yet sometimes painfully blunt comments are just funny, if anything. Thou walkest alone. On all these harsh nights, thou hast sought no company. I mean, here, for example, it's absolutely none of his business, and yet Withers feels the need to talk about it. Plus, he's got a bard eternally bound to him for parties, so I think under all that gold, mummified skin and ancient tombish voice, Jurgle is just a very old being. Loyal, foremost, to his ultimate purpose of recording dead souls, but outside of that, just enjoying the revelry of mortals and participating in their banter with, fittingly, the perfect degree of balance. I could go on analysing the nature of Withers, Jurgle, but I think you get the picture. So what do you guys think? And most importantly, are there other details providing more clues that I missed at all in this video? With so many branching storylines and hidden areas, I wouldn't be surprised, but let me know. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the fascinating yet mysterious character that is Withers. Thank you, as always, to my incredible patrons for keeping the channel alive, helping me take the time I need to ensure videos like this are properly researched. You could support for as little as a pound a month for early video access, your name on this screen, as well as a special rank in the Discord server, which you can also join through the description. Thank you for watching, I'm Sam Bram, and I hope thou hast a fine day.